Hello and welcome back to the KECC channel. I'm Rob and I hope you're having a wonderful day today. Today, we're jumping into some malicious compliance. Our first story today comes to us from Cracksnap7. You want the exact amount, you get the exact amount. Let's jump right in. When I was 13 or 14, I decided I wanted a PS3. My dad refused to buy me one, but my uncle made me an offer I couldn't refuse. He said that if I worked at his sweet shop for the two months of summer break, he would buy me a PS3 and some games in lieu of payment. For teenage me with no commitments, this seemed fantastic. My uncle sold a kind of specialty snack known as a mini samosa in his shop. They are like samosas, but smaller, about 3.5 to 4 centimeters in size, about 1 2,286th of a football field for my American friends. <laughs> They were sold by weight in sealed packs of 250 grams and 500 grams, as these were the most common amounts people bought. Making those packages turned out to be my job. You see, sometime between now and when Uncle started his business, he realized that 250 grams was roughly the weight of 28 mini samosas, and thus 56 were 500 grams. So instead of weighing each packet, I was told to just pack by counting individual items, which was easier and save time. We also sold them individually for people who wanted larger, smaller, or unusual amounts. This was also around the time when our government started airing customer awareness PSAs. Basically, just telling customers to beware of fraudulent business people, this is relevant. So, one particularly hot afternoon, it was just me and my uncle at the shop. In India, frequent power cuts were very common during summers, and thus, there were no fans or AC running. Both tempers and temperatures were running high at the shop that day. It was then that the villain of our story, Mr. Karen, made his entry. He was a local resident and a regular. He seemed angry from the onset when he barged into the shop. He took a look at the fans and saw that they weren't running, then angrily picked up a 500 gram pack of samosas and asked, how many samosas are in this thing? That's 500 grams, I said. I said how many, not how much, Mr. Karen literally screamed. Again, how many in this? 56, I replied immediately, since, you know, I packed them. How can you be so sure? You didn't even count. You're trying to cheat me. Mr. Karen was now in full scale Karen mode. I demand you pack me 500 grams of those individual ones, and don't you dare cheat me again. I looked over at my uncle, wet with sweat, fanning himself with yesterday's newspaper. He slowly nodded. I beamed a huge smile. Sure, sir, whatever you want. So I took a bag, picked up some samosas, and started putting them on the balance. I kept counting samosas as I put them in until they were a little over 500 grams. Then I removed the last samosa and the weight fell below 500. Now, keeping eye contact with Mr. Karen, I crushed the samosa and started putting its powdery remains in the bag until it was exactly 500 grams. But wait, there's more. Mr. Karen apparently didn't seem to mind powdered samosa, but instead asked smugly, so how many samosas now? 48, I claimed triumphantly. You see, sometime in the past, my uncle's old chef retired, and the new chef made samosas with a little bit more filling in them. They looked the same size on the outside and only weighed a couple grams more each, and since he made them in bulk and also sold to other shops in the area, the price wasn't too much of an issue. So my uncle let it slide. But those couple grams added up on mass orders, and that is what Mr. Karen found out the hard way. He looked sheepishly at the pre-packaged samosas and then at his own package and asked if he could buy the former instead. No, my nephew made a package specially for you at your request, so that is what you have to buy. My uncle finally spoke. Mr. Karen silently took his pack, paid, and left. He was a lot more respectful during his subsequent visits. I was reminded of this story yesterday when my PS3 finally died. As evident, English is not my first language, in fact, it's not even my third, so please excuse any mistakes. I absolutely love seeing those disclaimers of English is not my first language because they usually write so much better than the actual English people on Reddit. I guess that says something about North American school systems, but we won't go there. One thing's for sure though, when Mr. Karen walked into that store that day wanting to get some samosas, I bet they didn't realize that they'd be walking out with a serving of humble pie. Do me a quick favor, have a look down below the video. If that subscribe button's still red, it means you're not actually subscribed to the KCC channel. Please hit that subscribe button for more daily Reddit stories. Our next story today comes to us from Tokyo Flex. 
Shocked Pikachu Boss, let's jump right in. I worked at a restaurant slash events venue some years back. Essentially, I was AGM of the place, and it was my job to coordinate service in the dining room, private event spaces, and music venue. Service concerts, private events, weddings, you name it, I coordinate and execute it with staff. This was the most challenging job I'd ever had at the time, but after a while, I'd found a groove and was doing the work of two or three people. New GM gets hired, I like her, she likes me, she recognizes my hard work and is glad to have me. I put in 50 to 60 hours a week, regularly there until 2 or 3 in the morning wrapping things up, last person in the building. I have a good relationship with the CEO and the COO, HR of the company, as we were one of six large franchises across the country. They like me and we have a good rapport when I see them. I'm working my butt off but really having fun too. Fast forward a few months and the relationship between me and GM sours. She is colder and more hostile toward me every day. I'm not sure what's going on, so ask her if we can talk. She calls a closed door meeting and arrives with a folder with some papers in it. She pulls out her cell and asks my permission to record. Yeah, sure, have fun. She then proceeds to lay out papers in front of me documenting all my shortcomings. Seven minutes late, timestamp verified, there was a blizzard that day and I wasn't late. I volunteered to come in early as other employees refused to drive and so was technically 53 minutes early inappropriate language in front of team members. Managers were joking and doing Sam Jackson mother effer impressions, and I used the S word. No one else got written up. Complaint from rehearsal dinner 912. The bride in a sleeveless dress was cold. We turned the heat up, and on and on, like 15 total completely fabricated charges against me. At this point, it's clear she's out to get me, but I have no clue why. She tells me I should probably think about putting in my two weeks notice. Okay, I immediately start looking for another job and actually nail one shortly with a better title and pay. Yay! Important to know, we always had these big weekly meetings on what was usually my day off. So I'd have to come in on my day off and sit in a meeting with a bunch of other managers, event directors, and chefs. These meetings were mandatory. I was never happy about it, but I complied as everyone else relied on me to coordinate services and events. After one of these meetings, I went out for a quick beer with a coworker who was a captain, essentially an event manager for us who would run smaller events. We got to talking and she told me that GM was afraid I was going to take her job and wants to get rid of me. GM had let it slip to chef during setup of an event and captain overheard while working. Wild. I don't want your job. I'm too busy already. So, malicious compliance. Our HR policies were a bit wonky as COO slash HR didn't really have experience with HR stuff. He was a great guy, but had cobbled together some awkward policies. In our official handbook, it was stated that the company prefers a three-week notice, accepts a two-week notice as industry standard, and in cases where the employee feels wronged, threatened, or unfairly targeted, a one-week notice is acceptable. Also, if the employee feels wronged, threatened, or unfairly targeted, it is acceptable for said employee to go over the head of their wronging, threatening, unfairly targeting boss directly to HR to submit their notice. So I follow company policy. I send COO slash HR an email giving my resignation. I briefly outline my reasons, thank him for all his wisdom and help, and give my one week, 168 hour notice, effective immediately, as of noon CST. The exact time I'm submitting notice. I don't get a response from COO slash HR, that's because he's on vacation in Greece. A week later, I cheerily show up for the mandatory meeting at noon on my day off. The meeting commences and GM is making a show of trying to call me out in front of the group for answers about the 300 person wedding event I'm due to run tomorrow. Trying to cement my incompetence to them, she tells me we're out of a certain brute champagne, no we're not, and asks me what we're going to do to sub for the party's toast, intending to catch me caught in the cold as it's too late to order an appropriate substitute. My response? Don't know, don't care, this is my last day, and I finished work 15 minutes ago. Good luck with the wedding, and I walked out. Q shocked Pikachu boss. The entire table was O-faced. There was a volley of emails after that between GM and COO slash HR, trying to deny my sick and vacation payouts, but I had technically followed all company policies. She had to put her signature on my final check. 
Sweet. Oh, I absolutely love how they were scared that you were going after their job, but now they get to do your job for you. I think one thing I would have done differently though is I would have come after them to pay me for the time for those meetings because that's my day off. If you want me to work, you're going to compensate me for it. Our next story today comes to us from Squirrely. You sure you want all that paperwork? Let's jump right in. At the time of malicious compliance, I was a project manager for a smaller industrial construction company on the Gulf Coast. We were adding on to an existing chemical plant in multiple phases. The first phase of the project went well. The client rep was easy to get along with and was very reasonable. He reported to their PM, but we almost never dealt with her. We would have weekly status meetings to discuss cost projection and forecasts, schedule updates, change orders, and requests for information, all of which always went well. Towards the end of the first phase, the client was bought and merged with another company. This wasn't a problem at first. We finished the first phase under budget, ahead of schedule, and were awarded the second phase. The new owner decided that the previous PM wasn't adequate and wanted her replaced. Pretty commonplace when things like this happen. They want people they know and trust. This change also changed the representative we had built a relationship with. While funding was getting worked out for the second phase, at the request of the client, my company kept me and three of my direct reports on, project manager, cost controller, construction manager, and admin. We assisted with scope development, contract T's and C's, constructability reviews, material ordering, and general planning. After two months, the client gave us the green light to proceed, so we got to work. I am not what is referred to as a change order artist in my industry. Unless it's a change of scope or an extreme unforeseeable weather delay, I try to steer away from requesting more money as much as possible. Sometimes there's no avoiding it, especially when the scope of work is lacking, but we had ample opportunity to vet and assist in defining the project scope, and I had estimated we would have roughly 25 change orders. Some jobs are not so lucky. We had accounted for 30 minutes every morning for safety talks and work permits to be given to the crew foremans, which is pretty standard for this client and facility. First day takes three hours to get permits. I think it's just growing pains, new people, it will improve. Second day, three hours. Third day, four hours. Day four is our first weekly meeting and I bring this up with some draft test COs, RFIs, and report to see how the new PM wants to see our weekly data moving forward. We discussed the permitting issue and I explained that I'm pretty flexible and believe in a give and take relationship, but I need help with permits if we're going to meet the project deadline and budgetary constraints. The PM decides he wants change orders submitted weekly in arrears one week to have real time numbers. This goes well for a couple of weeks, permit issuance time went down and I fell into my give and take attitude. I wouldn't include every delay or change believing this was the high road and trying to build a relationship. Then something happened. The PM got weird. His whole attitude and demeanor changed. The PM states he now wants change orders submitted every day per discipline per instance. I try to explain we have four disciplines and that would be an enormous amount of unnecessary paperwork and that I'd rather have a conversation about these as some of them will not be worth the paper they're written on. But he insists every deviation, every change. I want everything on paper and submitted daily for approval. All supporting documentation needs to be included. His attitude change clicks with me now. He thinks we won't be able to keep up with the mountain of paperwork. He even made it a point to amend our contract with this, stating if we didn't follow this, we would lose billing rights for extra work. Q malicious compliance. I sit down with my cost controller, construction manager, and eight foremen to explain what the client wants. Any scope change, permit delay, operations delay, or scaffold delay was to be radioed in immediately to the cost controller to request a new cost code to track hours. We would track any materials or equipment rentals to these respective codes as well. We would develop an estimate on the scope changes and on the delays. We would provide actual hours and submit these requests at the end of each day. Once the work for the scope changes was completed, the original CO estimate would be actualized. The individual COs would then be submitted as independent invoices at the end of the month, in addition to our normal scope invoices. This was not a large project at all, valued at about $8 million for four months of work and 100 construction personnel. 
When the project was all said and done, we had submitted roughly 800 change orders valued at 1.6 million. The PM and his team would have to review 150 to 200 invoices a month, some of which were only for $54 for a 15 minute delay. The cherry on top, the client now took too long to vet the invoices and wouldn't pay timely per the contract. Every month the client had to pay an additional 3% due to late payment fees. Petty? It sure was, but I gave him exactly what he wanted. I ended up making my company and me a lot of money on that project. Well OP, I hope you got a hefty bonus out of that one because you made the company a lot more money in that case. I love when somebody new comes in and takes over and tries to micromanage every little thing, especially for a company that's been around for a long time and knows exactly what they're doing. It usually just doesn't come out in the new manglement's favor. Our last story today comes to us from Gasping Jill Franks. I adhered to the sickness policy to the letter. Let's jump right in. In the early 2000s, I worked in the UK for a huge American insurance company. I managed a team of 10 to 12 administrators. The job was dull, the people were mainly great, and it was a steady place to work. Now, with this being a US company, the benefits package was poor compared to most UK rivals. Things like paid annual leave and paid sickness were the statutory minimum it was legal to give in the UK. I had this guy join my team who I shall call Dan. Dan was about 22, 23, a bit of a plotter, definitely just there until he could find something better, and I couldn't blame him. One Monday, when he'd been there about three months, he didn't show up one Monday morning. I was initially concerned, but when he hadn't called or shown up 45 minutes later, I started looking for his home phone number to check he was okay. Right then, my phone rang, and it was Dan. He told me on the Friday night he had gone out with friends and got really drunk. When he got home, he decided to deep fry some chips, fries on the stove. He fell asleep, and when he woke up, the pan was on fire on the stove, black smoke billowing everywhere. Now, I think I would have just run, but as he was pretty drunk, he decided to open the kitchen window in his apartment and throw the fiery pan outside. He managed to get boiling hot fat all over his dominant hand. Fat spilled all over and caught fire, so he ran and called the fire service. On the way out, he grabbed his wallet, coat, and three CDs. Along with the clothes he had on, this was all that survived. He was really upset and told me he had no insurance for his possessions. He was going to be off sick for some weeks. The doctors thought he may need a skin graft on his hand. I told him to leave things with me. I would sort stuff out at work and would call him later. I called our local HR team who said there was very little they could do due to his length of service, he only had six paid sick days left. He had taken a few already. I was shocked. I asked if we could bend the rules, no. Is there a fund we could donate something to him from? No. Feeling this was really mean, I called HR in our head office and got the same answers. Very shortly afterwards, I got a call from our local HR manager, Claire, who was usually nice with me. We were on some of the same staff committees together. But today, she wanted to know why I had tried to go over her head, yada yada yada. She said that the sickness policy was clear, and I had to follow it to the letter. Did I understand? You bet I did. Cue malicious compliance. I filled in all the paperwork to send to Claire, some of it authorizing the deduction of Dan's pay, as he would exceed his sickness benefits that month. I think Claire was surprised I had rolled over so easily. I wasn't known for that. About an hour later, I sent her an email asking her to proofread a poster I had created to go on one of our committee notice boards. It was all about Dan and what had happened to him, and suggested ways the different teams could raise some money to help him out, as he had nothing, and unfortunately wasn't entitled to any sick pay. I immediately got a, please don't progress this any further just now, email from Claire. And half an hour later or so, she called to let me know they were granting three months paid sickness leave initially, and a goodwill payment of £5,000 on behalf of the company to help him get back on his feet. Dan was amazed at the magic I'd worked, and Claire was pretty frosty with me for about six weeks. I absolutely love this. Hey company, let's grow a heart and actually do something for somebody who works here. 
Otherwise, you're going to get thousands of complaints from the employees. It was great to see how quickly the company rolled over in this case. I think I can speak for the whole KCC community when we say that we hope Dan can get back on his feet and have a really quick recovery. Check out all four OPs linked in the description down below. I thank you for watching. I hope you have a wonderful day and we'll see you tomorrow.